Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Tech Strong Women, where we feature amazing women doing amazing things in tech. I'm Jody Ashley, executive producer here at TechStrong, and I'm here with my co-host, Tracy Reagan, creator and CEO of Deploy Hub. Before I introduce today's guests, I want to give you a quick day update about what's happening here at TechStrong. Be sure to register for TechStrong Con 2024, happening on April 3rd. It's our virtual event. Speaker submissions are still open. And of course, we always love sponsors. So be sure and reach out. And if you're attending KubeCon in Paris, March 19th through the 22nd, TechStrong will be live streaming interviews from the event all week. So you want to be sure and stop by our booth and say hello or reach out and we'll set you up for an interview. You can register for all of our events by going to techstrongevents.com and be sure to tune in every day to TechStrong TV for great shows and interviews. Hey, Tracy, what's on your mind today? Now, I know we, we, we don't want to really geek out too much, but I'm going to take us there anyway. <laughs> I want to talk today, I want to talk about quantum computing. Oh. Now, why did I bring this up? It's because, you know, I'm always looking at, um, and I'm, I'm really starting to read more about AI, and I want to, in my head, I'm thinking, how do we apply some of this new technology to solving the problem of cyber attacks through our software supply chain? How do we start trending on it and how do we react to it? Because there's so many dependencies and there's so many pieces of the of the puzzle. So I started looking at quantum mechanics, quantum computing, and I just want to bring it up because I <laughs> believe that we're going to see more of it. And as young women out there, you know, look at where they should focus their careers. I always say focus it on the newest stuff because everybody's new and it's easy to be new when everything's new. <laughs> <laughs> and it puts you in a really good place for the future. And it's not necessarily that scary. It just sounds scary. But just let me, uh, let me give you an example of what a qu quantum computing is. So in our regular kind of computers that we have today, we... We, we, it, they perform tasks, and they do that by manipulating bits, and those bits are valued at one or zero. Well, quantum computing is very is, is similar but different. It's non-binary. <laughs> uh, it, instead of it, it can be one, it can be zero, or it can be both. Um, and also, one bit can one qubit is what they call them can influence another qubit state. So they have these states that they would call superpositions or entanglements. And what that does is it creates a, a, a broader way of processing and manipulating data. It becomes, um, instead of just one and zero, we have uh, one and zero or both, or something that's in between, something that super, has a superposition or has an entanglement. And it gives us the ability to come up with more answers. Our regular computing often gets stumped. It says, oh, I can't answer this because it can only answer things in ones and zeros, but not everything is, that, is black and white, correct? And quantum computing is addressing that. There's a whole, it's a whole new, a new interesting field. IBM's doing a lot of work around it. I find it to be pretty interesting um, from just a, what the future of computing is gonna look like. And it's this kind of processing along with our large language models is, is what's going to take us to a higher level of solving problems. So today I say, go learn about quantum um, computing. It's pretty fascinating. And IBM's got some stuff that you can play on. All right, very cool, very cool. Yeah, I, I saw a really, uh, I think the 60 Minutes did a really cool thing on quantum computing a couple months ago. And um, I was really, intrigued by it too. So it's going to be pretty exciting to watch that grow over time. Well, everybody, I'd like to introduce you to our guest today, Christine Golain. <laughs> Did I say it right? <laughs> I've had her last name in my brain wrong for too long, and now I'm trying to relearn it. Christine, tell us a little bit about you. 
Thank you. And thank you for having me and uh, saying my name correctly, <laughs> uh, pronouncing my name correctly. Uh, yes, Christine Galayan. Uh, currently, I am a program manager in uh, Sony's Global Information Security Group. Um, but I actually started, it's funny that you mentioned quantum computing and the bits with zeros and one, because I started my career as a software engineer at Sprint, and I was hired to prepare for Y2K. So, um, you know, coding in COBOL, and that was at that time, uh, thinking that I was coding in COBOL, and then just however many years later, you're talking about quantum computing, is just so exciting and fascinating. Um, but after a few years of doing consulting in telecom, I fell into the cyber industry and um, just have been loving it. And throughout that journey, I really found a great passion for, um, you know, the women in the field. Uh, I was president of Women in Technology, and then now I'm currently the chair for STEM for Her, which is a 501c3 um, organization. And our mission is really to empower and educate young girls, young women in the field of STEM, um, and mostly the under, um, you know, the disadvantaged populations. Um, and I'd love to speak about the importance of that, you know, later in this discussion as well. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a very uh, short version of uh, my journey in the IT industry. Well, you know, every woman we talk to um, one of the first questions we ask is, tell us about you as a young, a young Christine. Mm -hmm. You know, did you have somebody in your life who influenced you? My mother really pushed me into the technical side of things. Um, I actually wanted to be an architect and she looked at me and she said, oh, honey, you could never do that. You can't draw a straight line, <laughs> <laughs> which was true. Nobody could even read my writing, much less be, me draw something. And she really pushed me towards STEM. Did you have somebody like that that influenced uh, you in your life? And kind of tell us what your journey was. You, did, you know, what did you study in college? You know, how did you end up in technology in the first place? Yeah. So, you know, growing up, I actually, I remember the young Christine, and I don't think it has changed since because I still love fashion, but the young Christine would, when my mom was out, she was an accountant, and when she was out in her job, I would steal some of her heels and dress up. So I always thought I'd be in business um, just because she would come home in her business attire. Um, and then in college, I actually studied international business and Spanish, but it was around that time frame that again I mentioned Y2K and I think the growth of the internet at that time um, that it was more of an external factor that pushed me in IT because I think at that time frame I wasn't sure I, I liked math I liked art and I didn't really know what was in front of me. Um, there weren't that many educators out there that was pushing for STEM. And that's why it's so important that, you know, what I'm doing with STEM for Her, it's so important to really expose those who would not see what STEM would be like um, and make it possible for them. But I think the young Christine was always definitely in the business field, in the international field, but the big thing was also creating an impact for whatever I was doing. And that's why I loved it when I was at Sprint because I saw the evolution. Again, it was a time frame where internet was growing. And I saw the evolution of, you know, I, I'm here in the States. You know, you had to call long distance or calling cards to call back to the Philippines. And then it's like the internet boom. And I'm able to connect with my family at home without having the great costs of, you know, long distance calls or anything. And then email came and it's just the convolution of, uh, connectivity and communication, um, I think the impact really helped me, you know, really learn more about technology. Oh, it, um, so, so true. And I, I personally think that during COVID, we had uh, so many virtual events. And I am, I, I will always be now a fan of virtual events. Um, TechStrong does great virtual events. 
because it democratized education around software. So for example, I, we, I, have, we, I run an open source project and not everybody can go to KubeCon. Not, not everybody can afford flights to these, uh, these places. And when we were doing virtual events, I felt like I, I felt really proud that the industry stepped up, did things virtual, and we kept we stayed connected and we continued educating. I feel that we've lost something going back to in-person events. While I know they're important, I feel like that they should be both, so that we can continue reaching out to more more individuals. We don't it, we don't create a class system that says, you know, if you're working for a big company and you they can that you have a training budget, you get to go to these. But if not, sorry. Right. And that is part of the problem with, you know, with, even with women, because oftentimes women can't say I'm going to leave my kids to go to a conference. It's hard for us for for some women to 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 leave the house for a week to go to Paris and hang out at KubeCon. <laughs> it's just not in our, it, it's just, it's not there for us. So I think the virtual events is so important and bringing everybody together through the internet has changed the way we, we see the world. Yeah, communication. And I think, you know, you were, again, going back to the advancing of, you know, quantum compute, uh, quantum computing, but now with the age of AI and virtual um, reality, I think one of the things that they're coming up with is like a screen or a projector so that if you are doing virtual conferences, you can kind of um, put this, uh, I don't know, little hub um, clip on your laptop and it, it's, it's kind of like a hologram of what the conference room would look like. And then now they have the headsets where you're more in 3D and not just like a TV like um, a person to person virtual. So I don't know, we're, we're in a really interesting time frame. And I'm glad I'm part of it. Well, and I've that I've seen too, since we've gone back to in person, a lot of these conferences have that have gone on forever and ever like RSAC and KubeCon and just there's so many out there have there a lot of them are offering a virtual post event for people who can't attend in person. And I think those I've watched those over the last four years just grow to be, you know, not just we're going to show a few speakers, but we're actually going to make it more immersive and you get to really participate after the fact. And so, I, yeah, I, I agree. I also think that it pulls the younger audience in, in a way, college kids, just out of college kids who would only get this exposure in a job. Now they can go to these virtual events that, again, they would not, not otherwise be able to participate in and get all this information. They can, for TechStrong, we create chat rooms. People can network with each other. People can meet each other. People can, you know, contact each other after the fact and I think that's just as important. Like Tracy said, we've turned it into this more what everybody always says, the hallway track at an in-person event, right? When you're walking down the hall and you see people you know, but virtual events are more and more developing into those kind of um, environments, which are super important, I think. And especially for just outreach. Yeah. So let's go back to STEM for her. <laughs> Tell us how you're uh, you're doing outreach to young women to get them in the door and get them excited about STEM. Yeah, I gosh, I can talk um, all day about this. <laughs> so you can always cut me off, Judy, or edit it out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yes, yeah, so STEM for Her, right now we are focused in the DC region and what our growth plan would be is, um, you know, maybe go to Richmond, Baltimore, uh, the cities surrounding us, and then maybe someday we'll have chapters um, all over the states. But our outreach right now, we do reach out to um, the Loudoun County Public Schools, um, all the different counties within Virginia, DC, and Maryland. And um, it is so fantastic. The girls are so in love with math and um, they already know what they want to do. And some of them, you know, they, and it's not just one thing. They want to be 
um, they want to do something within the biomedical field, but at the same time, also do something with mechanical engineering so that they can come up with, um, you know, solving uh, solving those who come back from war. Maybe they don't have hands, but it's amazing their imagination and creativity right now. And I think it's the exposure to internet and everything that they can see that it's possible. Um, but we do have middle school, high school, and um, college age students within STEM for her. Um, and our outreach is really, uh, we do a lot of programs that, uh, for example, last year, we did a program with the FAA. And it was to celebrate, I think it was one of their, it's their own Wi-Fi capability in the air, whatever technology that was, it was their 25th year anniversary for that technology. So they invited STEM for her. The girls got to do, you know, uh, flight simulations, and then they got to look at the weather map. So it was not just, um, you know, uh, flight and pilot. It was also uh, meteorology as well. So um, I think the more that they learn, the more that they get engaged. And that's why we want to expose them to these um, industries that they may have never thought about it. And then a lot of what we get, the feedback, is that um, I now know I can do it. I never thought I could, but I see that that's a female pilot. She looks like me. She talks like me. We're the same color. And she's rocking it. So I know that I can rock it, too. So and that's really our mission. Yes, and I'm, you know, those those young girls, as soon as they're exposed to the possibilities, I know that they'll soar. But we still have a huge cultural issue in this in STEM and in, in corp. Let's just call it the corporate STEM world. Mm -hmm. I heard a discussion. Um, I don't know where where I was about um, a person saying if they saw a woman pilot, they would ask to get off the plane. Oh, you're kidding. No, I'm not. I wish I can't remember where I heard it was like I was listening to the news or something and they, they were talking about um, basically diversity and how there still was a, uh, you know, it, in some areas, they still believed a man should be doing it and not a woman should be doing it. And that's not and that's not everywhere. But we still have that problem. Um, well, and it and goes beyond that. It goes beyond that because it's not just a woman. It's a woman of color, too. Right. Like Christine is saying, these little girls need to see someone who looks like them in every way to, mm -hmm. to be like, oh, wow, you know, I can do that. I it's can so do important. That. So it goes just, it goes so far beyond just being women to being diverse, diverse. We have to have the role models. We have to, <laughs> exactly. they have to. Christine had her mother as a role model. She wanted to put her mother's business clothes on and she wanted to go out <laughs> exactly. and be a business person, right? That yes. was a role model, though, that, that imprinted in your mind that you could do that, too. And you, she must have been beautiful and in her beautiful business clothes. And you wanted to aspire to that. Uh, you yeah. Know. You know, I remember, too, you know, that's what I wanted. That that was the view uh, connotation that I had when I would graduate from college. Right. And then um, I entered the workforce and I felt like I had to because it was you know, programming, male-dominated industry. I was usually the only female in the room in meetings, and I felt like I had to hide my femininity mm -hmm. a bit where it's, okay, maybe I shouldn't wear my nice suit or dress. Maybe I'll just wear pants all the time. Um, maybe I should just pull my hair back. It's like I, I couldn't be authentically me because authentically me didn't fit in the IT world yet. And I think that's, I'm glad that, you know, however many years now we, we do see more women in the room and, you know, any hairstyle, any um, uh, clothing goes, but it's just, it took a while for me to really embrace who I was and really be me in a meeting. Um, and then it actually changes like, Okay, physical, but then mentally too, I felt stronger when I was more me instead of hiding. I could really voice myself when I felt stronger. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's still, it, it's come a long way, but we do still have some time to go. Um, 
I was at a conference where uh, someone did an exercise with us, the speaker did an exercise with us. And I was like, all right, close your eyes. I want to do an exercise. Picture yourself in a plane. And as you're getting up out of the plane, the pilot says this. And then the meals come. And then you're walking out of the room and there's a family there. Okay, now open your eyes. Um, can you tell me in your mind, what did you think? the was the pilot a male or female was um you know the server a male or female so and 90 percent, 95 percent of the room said that the pilot was male so i think it's just ingrained in our minds and that's one thing that needs to shift boy well said it really does need to shift and it's interesting that you talk about being your authentic self and i'm looking right now at our our tech strong women we had a we had a guest who actually wrote a book about being your authentic self and how important it was for you to achieve success and i'm sorry i don't remember which woman it was <laughs> it's frustrating because she had she had some really good tips around that particular problem and she talked about it from the aspect of you cannot succeed if you have something that you're kind of dragging along with you all the time. And that's the thought that you have to fit into a, 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 a male world or a, a certain format that you may, you may not fit into. So if you want to have purple hair and tattoos, you should be able to do that because it's your skills that we're looking at. And the more you can be your authentic self, the better you can be at your job. <laughs> well, yeah, you're not sitting in the room worrying about how your appearance is or how you're being, you know, you know, the guys aren't sitting around doing that, but it's just, it's a distraction, right? It's a total distraction to your, to being able to just do what you want to do. Yeah, Trace, I'll figure out who it was. We've had so many. This is yeah, such it a was you're not, you're, it's so when I hear that, I mean, you're so not the first person who has told us that the whole, what do I wear? What do I do with my hair? It's like, <laughs> yeah. And I remembered um, this is at a different company and I was lucky enough and fortunate enough where um, it, it's a really big company, but each quarter they would have the uh, C-suite come. So the CEO, the president, everyone. And at this time frame, I remembered we had, and this is when cloud was just starting to become cloud and no one knew what cloud was, but we had a female executive that was in charge of that vertical. And so, you know, someone was talking about, they were talking about the numbers, all the leaders were on stage. And finally, it was awesome to see that there was a woman on stage as well. But then a lot of my colleagues, um, male and female, were kind of saying, oh, well, why is she wearing that or her heels and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, well, because those men, they can rock their Rolexes and their Hugo Boss suits. She can certainly wear her Jimmy Choo's or whatever. She can wear whatever she wants. And her message about the cloud was so strong. And I wish that it was so strong, but I wish that what they were saying about her clothing, it like overpowered and it overshadowed her message. But her message was so strong about the cloud and it was so insightful. So um, that was probably 15, I'd say 10 to 15 years ago. Um, I'm sure it's changed now, but that, I, that was so ingrained in my mind, that memory. Well, I'm tall. Oh. I'm five foot nine. And so when I put on a pair of heels, I'm like six feet without any problem. And the number of times at work, I would be taller than a man, especially if it was a four inch heel. And they would, they would, comment because I was looking down on them because they had to look up at me. And I was like, and I actually found it to be pretty fun because it was like, okay, fine. If that intimidates you, I guess that's your problem. But for a long time, I didn't wear, I wore flats all the time. And I reached a point where I'm like, you know, I want to dress the way I want to dress. And, and, but it, it's funny because especially as a woman, if you're taller than them, because they're, you know, they're 5'10", 5 5'11", 5 and you're 6'6", six, 6'1", six, um, yeah, they don't, they're like, they don't like it. It's pretty funny. Well, this goes to another discussion, right? Because if you can't be who you want to be and wear your four inch heels and be six foot tall, you may not use your voice. 
right? Right. Right. So that's the first step for fixing the problem is to be okay with who you are in order to find your voice. I always tell people, I think I was 50 before I found my voice. It took me a long time. I would sit quietly in meetings and once in a while I would say to somebody, would you please, you have to stop talking right now because you're going to embarrass yourself. <laughs> <laughs> because what you're saying is completely not accurate. And I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to use my voice today, but it would have to be, it, I have, it would have to go pretty far before I would say, wait a second, everything you're saying is not actually true. Um, and if we make decisions based on this discussion, we're going to make wrong decisions. So well, why, you know, it took a long time for me to go, I'm okay wearing my platforms on my mini skirt and using my voice in a meeting. Well, and what Christine said is so important because these girls are coming to this program, STEM for her, and they are this generation of kids. I have a 26-year-old daughter and she doesn't struggle nearly with this the way oh. we did. They come in and they're like, what? I I can do whatever you can do. I And, you know. I think it's amazing because they just have a totally different attitude. And the more we can empower them, the better. Yeah. And same, Tracy, I, it, I don't think that I found my voice until later on as well. Um, probably just, you know, 10 years ago. But um, yes, I love it. Be what you just mentioned, Jody, because I love, so I call them, I have a group of friends, they're girls, and I know you see the um, memes or the gifs out there saying like intergenerational friendships are great at work or, or coworkers and friendships are um, very important. And I call them my small group of friends here, um, my wit next gen. So women and technology next gen, because <laughs> I'm like, I, I think I'm gen X, am I gen X? And then I have someone that's a millennial and then also gen Z and we go out all the time and then the stories that they tell me when they're saying, oh, like one of them wanted to go back to school and they were negotiating with the universities, like which one of you is going to give me a lower rate for my tuition? And I'm like, did I ever do that? No, I did <laughs> not. And then um, another one is like, oh, well, I told my manager that, you know, this, and that. they know what they want, this next generation. They are using their voice so much more to fight for, you know, what they think is right. Um, so I'm so glad because I don't think that I had ever done what they've done in the years that they're doing it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Tracy, it was um, Trisha Montalvo Tim who wrote right. the book. We interviewed her, and she wrote a book called "Embrace the Power of You." Embrace the power of you, owning your identity at work. And she talked all about some of the things that you've brought up. It's a it's a good read. Yeah. So viewers who want to expand on this this particular topic, that is a good place to go, and it might be a good place for your your uh, stem for her ladies, right? Yeah. So they're okay with it. And you have to be told you're okay with it. I'm just going to say one more thing on this topic, and then I want to ask some technical questions. But <laughs> I went and saw the movie Origin. Um, I don't know if you've heard about it yet. It's based on this book called The Cast, C-A-S-T-E, like the, like the cast system. Yeah, I've heard about it. Oh, boy. It is. You have to be brave and go see it. I can tell you I cried for about 20 minutes, like <laughs> cried cried for about 20 minutes watching it. It's a really good, really good movie. It's about the woman who wrote it and her journey in writing this book, Cast. Um, but it talks about a caste system in every culture. And in what, in many ways, what we're talking about here is the caste system and where women are on the, on the, you know, on the ladder of technology. Men have always, we actually used to dominate technology. Let's remember that. And somehow in the 80s, we lost that position. And men have always now been on the top. And I always t tell people this, women in technology who are out like me with startups, we have about access to about 2%, less than 2% of investment, less than 2% of investment. So it's hard to get those people, the women up the, the chain to be role models. But we have to understand it from the caste system because we start thinking about it that way. We start understanding how to support each other, how to use our voice when we see it happening and how to fix the problem for good. Now, 
<laughs> you're in the security business, and I. This is an area I'm 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 pretty focused on because of what we're doing um, at Deploy Hub. My company is we're gathering security data. Where do you see if we, if we look at the future and we say within the next five years, where do you see the biggest holes in our security? Does it continue to be in ransomware? Is it in the software supply chain? Is it in you know penetration? Um, is it in denial of service? You know, where should uh, organizations start focusing their attention in the security realm? If I were to look like at a roadmap, I don't think it would. Well, ransomware. I think will always be there in just because of the money that comes with it. But I think with the rise of AI, um, you know, we have to think about what are the new things and how do we secure them? Because I know, uh, you know, um, so for example, um, endpoint security, let's say. So it used to be, okay, I'm going to push something out to your computer, endpoint security, and it's going to um, identify that malicious vector, and then it's going to block it, and then we'll do something about it. But now they're adding AI, some companies are adding AI into that endpoint detection so that it's not only like, okay, I'm just going to continue to monitor, block it, and then do something with it. It's actually now learning the habits of what the user is doing in the system and then kind of bringing that back. I, I mean, I don't think they're doing it maliciously. They're just trying to collect data to gather what the habitual um, you know, acts are to learn more about the uh, process and in the computer and what's going on. But I think the more that they're going to add AI into these certain products, that of course there's gonna be some player that's going to do something with it. So I think trying to figure out where, how we can stop the bad actors from the AI um, features that are being plugged in to some of these um, solutions that we have now, that's kind of a big thing that I'm looking at. I, you know, I, I just was reading something on a similar topic around that, you know, because AI needs these large language models, right? Uh, generative AI does. And how do we start protecting those, those large language models? It's a data, you know, data security has always been a top priority. And this is a whole different kind of data security. It may not be somebody logging in and with a one, two, three password, <laughs> and, and somebody gets to your data, it may be something um, a little uh, more complex and a little more nefarious and hidden. Uh, and so how do we start protecting that? And also on the news today, before I sat down, I was having some coffee and they, they started talking about, you know, the disinformation campaigns we'll probably start seeing in 2024 that are AI generated. And how do we start, and that's part of security. I mean, yeah. if you think about the U.S., those those disinformation campaigns can be really, really bad for the, the security of the nation and in any nation that experiences that. So I think you're right. AI security is an area that we all should be really talking about. So they're and already doing it, too. They're already doing it. They did a robocall where they used AI to generate the president's voice to tell people not to go vote. Yeah. It's already oh, happening. Wow. Yeah, yeah, they did yeah. it in one of they the did primary do that. states. And they and and they used his like words like malarkey and you know the folksy words that Joe Biden likes to use and it was we I listened to it and it was frightening and they're in big trouble they're being prosecuted for it I mean they jumped all over it but still doesn't that, that prosecution could last another six years and though and exactly <laughs> but the they, did, on they, our they legal took system. it very seriously much more quickly than I've ever seen happen like they they're trying to nip it in the butt but yeah it's already going on and that's not it we could you know we think about just threat models how do you know your threat model hasn't been tweaked right so there's so many aspects of ai that we haven't thought about yet it's more than just did we did somebody put a piece of open source code that wasn't secure in their in their software <laughs> or they pulled in a you know a, a windsock dll and to a um, SolarWinds uh, application that was bad. 
it is these things are becoming more and more complex. That's why the that's why the discussion around quantum computing for today, because there's so complex environments that we're dealing with now. Thousands of dependencies, thousands of configuration settings, and so many ways to attack a system. Um, it it's sad that we're here, but we are. And for your for your ladies who are going to watch this, because I know they will, cybersecurity is a really good area to be in if you <laughs> want to go into STEM. It can be a different, you know, cybersecurity is, covers many things, mm -hmm. not just software. Yeah, like policy, privacy. Yeah, yeah. The U.S. government spending some time. I saw another thing on the news uh, on Reuters. They said that the government is starting to track, you know, how well we're addressing vulnerabilities in software. And over 2023, we uh, in, in, increased our performance by 20%. That's not a lot. Mm -hmm. but it's bigger it's 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 the right direction it's like it's better than zero <laughs> something right? it's better than it's like being on you know it's <laughs> going on a diet and getting on the scale of you know every week and then finally you go i lost two pounds it's going the right direction <laughs> at least it's going the right direction right and then if you think about like fintech too all these payments um you got to secure them in the right way um Gosh, and then the stock market, they have algorithms that they use as well. And then you inject AI into it. And yeah, it, it's think about it's space. Big. Yeah. Space force and space exploration and Seattle and satellite. I keep calling them Seattle's satellites, uh, you know, <laughs> the satellite management. That could be pretty bad, right? Yeah. And and utilities and energy. These are all core places where in particular in the in in like the energy sector we have old systems they can mm -hmm. easily be hacked really old systems and you know it's, it's not just ai and the new stuff it's some of the old stuff that's been running out there so yeah, it's a really good area to go into so ladies you know take that on make that the where women succeed <laughs> in cybersecurity because it will be a big, big area in the, in, I'd say in the next 15 to 20 years, we're gonna see a lot of development in this space and a lot of new jobs. And it is, an, it, you know, if you like being a spy, it's an interesting area, <laughs> it really is. Christine, when you're working with the, the um, younger women, is there a, a specific area that, you know, with social media and all this stuff they're exposed to, is there an area that you see more of them leaning towards or is it, is it diverse? It's pretty diverse. Um, I'm just very, uh, sometimes I just get really, um, like I'm surprised with some of the mm -hmm. things that they come up with. Like I said in the beginning, um, mathematics is a big one for them. So they're trying to learn um, more, you know, it is it just accounting, is it finance? But then we're like, no, it's data analytics. And then you can turn it into what you can do at NASA. And then it talks about algorithms. So um, it's kind of expanding their knowledge on that specific uh, subject. So S, science, is it just this? And if you think about it, you know, we have the T for technology, science, technology, engineering, math. But then technology is hitting each and every single one of the science, engineering, mm -hmm. and math as well. So we're trying to tell them the evolution of what STEM is. But yeah, mathematics is a big one for them. Um, a lot of them want to do um, aerospace um, engineering, which is fantastic. And it's just not your uh, typical what we grew up thinking what STEM was. It's so advanced in their thinking. And that's what I love about it. But mathematics is a big one for them. That's good. Girls feel empowered to do math. We know yes. that wasn't always the case. Yes. <laughs> you know, the aerospace industry, this, basically the space market could grow to a trillion dollars by 2030. It went up from, I'm reading this, 447 billion um, last year, up from 280 billion in 2010. And they propose it, they, they believe it'll get to a trillion dollars by 2030. Wow. It is a, going to be a very big, it is, it is, a new, it is the new frontier. And it's a very interesting um, area to get into because there's going to be a, you know, you don't have to go into space. I wouldn't go into space, <laughs> but you could be working on antennas and, you know, and all kinds of new technology and space vehicles that they're going to be putting up in the, you know, in, into orbit. Uh, and so it's another big area to get into if you're into STEM. 
Yeah. And then if you think about even just retail, right? Um, they're not thinking about it of, you know, just designing clothes. It's okay. Well, um, there's now, I think it's either Nike or one of those um, <clears throat> vendors that have um, uh, clothes where for deaf people, they can wear it and it will, whatever they go to concerts, it kind of lets them feel the beat even more. There's like sensors all over oh, wow. um, that shirt. And then they have shoes. I think it's Nike that has this where um, those who may have lost limbs in the war, et cetera, it's like they don't need to tie shoelaces. They just put the um, their foot in the shoe and it just wraps by itself. So mm -hmm. it's just thinking about where we are today, what does society look like today, and then what does technology look like today to use that and, you know, it, try to visualize what people need, and then they do it. Yeah. That's, that's a pretty cool description, the clothes that are smart. Yeah. Yeah, smart clothing. Smart clothing. Smart clothing. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a new one. I haven't really thought about smart clothing. Well, that's, and, that's really and, cool. I mean, there's companies that have done... Like even lower levels of it, but they're doing it. It's like Columbia, which is a huge brand that I like to wear, has designed this whole inner lining that's reflective. So you can wear a coat in really cold weather that's half the weight of a big puffy coat, but because it looks like tinfoil, but it's not, but the fabric and the designing in it, it reflects your heat back onto your body. So it keeps you much warmer with way less materials than... A regular big puffy winter coat where you're walking. That around. is really like, cool. I had yeah. Columbia's has this whole line of it. We have it, and sometimes it's too warm. Like you can't wear it to the grocery store because <laughs> that all warm is and really hot. cool. I have to I think, decide what the weather is and what I'm doing, and pick the coat that has it or doesn't because I need that. that well, I need that for gloves. I need you're gonna have to afterwards. You have to send me a text yeah. to let me know what it is because I need that for writing. I oh, yeah. hate putting on heavy coats for writing. Oh, oh, totally. I'll hook you up. It's great. And I'm freezing. I'm only in like, a. And I'm, it's like, okay, I wish I'd get warmed up because it's cold out here right now yeah. to ride. <laughs> but that's, it's so cool. That, and, and Christine's right. There's so many cool ways that, you know, watch some Star Trek episodes, people. Look at yeah. all the cool futuristic things that... <laughs> That are happening. <laughs> that we used to watch, they're all coming to fruition. That's <laughs> cool. We're huge Trekkie yeah. fans in my house. Now I'm just ready to be beamed up someplace, right? <laughs> Beam me up. Oh, I don't want to go to space. I want to stay on Earth. <laughs> I wouldn't mind. It's cold right now. I wouldn't mind being beamed to some beach somewhere right now, though. That is real. <laughs> well, you guys, we are we are coming to the end of our time together. Christine, this was so great. I got to tell everyone, I've been trying for all, like a year to get her here, and it just hasn't worked out. And even with everyone getting sick at the end, we still pulled it together. So thank yeah. you so much for being and here. Good luck with your girls, really. Oh, yeah. Your STEM for Her is such an important project. Uh, congratulations on the work that you've done, and I wish you all success as you move into those different uh, areas, those different thank states. You. Thank you. And thank you for having me. I'll make sure that, um, you know, in three months we do this again. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. That hey, would be great. Cool. Yeah. It's such a, it's such a great time to meet with you. So thank you. Maybe so much. we should bring some of your STEM for her girls who are, who have found well, their voice so we could do a little so panel. Eloquent, that they are so eloquent. They would absolutely love it. Oh, let's plan. Let's do it. I right. will. That I would, would be, be in fun. touch with you. I would love to do a panel with you and, and some of your girls. That's amazing. Great call Trace. All right, everybody, stay tuned. There's a lot more Tech Strong TV to watch today. Thank you, Christine, for being with us. And we'll see you next time on Tech Strong Women. Thanks. Stay well. Thank you.